doesn't like a fresh start. Well, today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us about the glorious prospect of all things made new as we study the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, on this five-year journey through God's Word, and I'm so glad that you've joined us as our journey through Revelation is quickly coming to a close. Now, if you're a new listener, don't worry, as we finish Revelation chapter 22 on Thursday, you can look forward to starting all over on Friday as we begin again to travel through all 66 books in five years. There's no more exciting time to be with us, so I hope that you'll stick around. And if you've missed a message, or maybe you want to share these messages with a friend, then just visit our website at ttb.org, where you can listen anytime for free. Before we begin, though, I've got just enough time for us to take a quick tour around the world and check in with fellow listeners who are traveling alongside us in the Bible bus. The first letter comes from a listener of our Umbundu language in Africa. He writes, I thank God for your program because I have learned so much. I never knew that a Christian should help his brothers. Before, I would lend money to my brothers and collect with profit. I was helping for selfish gain. But now I know that the first thing I should do is to help those in need. I thank God that you have changed my heart and helped me follow the leading of the Lord. Well, what a great lesson. And then our next letter comes from a listener of our Bengali program in India. Not long ago, my husband and I were fighting a lot and our marriage was in trouble. One day I left my husband to stay with a friend. At our home, I began to listen to your program. Hearing God's word convicted me of my bitterness and helped me to realize I needed to ask my husband for forgiveness and see if he would begin again. I am happy to say that today we have reconciled. We attend church together and listen to your program every evening. Please pray that we will continue to seek God first in our lives and not ourselves. And then here's a letter. This is from a listener of our Hindi program in India. I used to be a very depressed person and the power of darkness ruled my life. I would often fight and beat my wife and children. In fact, I wanted to be separated from my family. One day I happened to listen to your program while I was searching for some entertainment on the radio. While I was listening to it, I heard that we should love one another, and since then I decided to show more love to my wife and children. Since then, I have been regularly listening to the program. Today my family is leading a very peaceful and joyful life. And then our last letter is from a listener of our Kabyle program in Algeria. It is with great pleasure that I take this opportunity to wish you happiness and the peace that Jesus gives his disciples. I am a faithful listener of your radio program. It encourages me in my Christian faith, and I'm not the only one who feels this way. Your programs are a blessing for all in Kabylia. I am happy to partner with you in spreading the news about salvation to mankind in obedience to our King, Jesus Christ. Please continue that more here will find the peace found only in our Lord. Well, to join us here at Through the Bible in praying for listeners like this around the world, simply join our world prayer team at ttb.org forward slash pray. And if you'd like to share what God's doing in your life as we study the word together, then contact us and leave a message on our listener testimony line when you call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Or, of course, you can send a letter via email to BibleBus at ttb.org, or you can also reach us the old-fashioned way by post mail at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. We really do love to hear from you, so write to us today. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity for fresh starts. We pray that the glorious light of your word will reach many needy hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, I'm coming back to the 21st chapter 
of Revelation, and I'll begin reading at verse 5 again and then move on through verse 7, and I'm reading from my translation. And he that sitteth on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he saith, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And he said unto me, They are come to pass. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit these things, and I will be God unto him, and he shall be the Son to me. Now, this is a very important section here, as we saw in the first part last time, that the glorious prospect of all things made new, and we can start over, and there will never be an end to our growth. You remember it says of the increase of his kingdom, there is no end. There is a constant growth and development, and just think of the prospect of that for the future. Now he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and that identifies the speaker as the Lord Jesus Christ as he was identified like that in the first chapter of this book. Now, believers in their new bodies will thirst after God and the things of God, and they'll be satisfied here. We're told he'll give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. And you remember he had said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. All believers are overcomers by faith. He that overcometh shall inherit these things. Well, all believers are overcomers because of faith. In 1 John 5, 4, I read, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And all the sons of God became sons through faith in Christ. But as many as received him, To them gave he the exousion power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John 1, 12. And they inherit all things, because this was promised to the sons of God. In Romans 8, 16 and 17, I read, The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And then here is an interesting expression. I will be God unto him, and he shall be the son to me. Now, the son to me is in the Greek, moihoios, a very unusual expression. In fact, Vincent calls attention to the fact that this is the only place in John's writing where a believer is said to be a son, a weos, that is in relationship with God, and God says it. And here he says it. Believers in the church are one of the peoples of God, but they are moa. They are the sons of God in a unique and glorious fashion. And as we've seen before, beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, or we shall see him as he is. Now I read verse 8, But for the fearful and unbelieving and defiled with abominations and murderers and fornicators and sorcerers and adulterers and all liars, their part shall be in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now there are several amazing features about this verse here. First of all, the creation of the new heavens and a new earth did not affect or change the status of the lake of fire and of the lost. They are going into eternity just that way. In the second place, there's no possibility of sin which made man become fearful, unbelieving, and lies and murders and all the rest ever breaking over the barrier into the new heavens and the new earth. Sin and its potential are forever shut out of the new creation. And finally, the lake of fire is eternal, for it's a second death, and there is no third resurrection. It's eternal, 
separation from God that we have here and there's nothing as fearful and frightful as that. Now will you notice, I come to verse 9 and I'm going to turn to a message that I have in the back of the second volume on the shape of things to come because we are now given a physical description of the new Jerusalem. And we are told here in verse 9, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, the appearance of this city is the quintessence of beauty, refined loveliness, and uncontrolled joy. Lofty language describes her merits, and descriptive vocabulary is exhausted in painting her portrait. And the contemplation of her coming glory is a spiritual tonic for those who grow weary on the pilgrim journey down here. The New Jerusalem is really a post-millennial city. And that sounds strange coming from me, I'm sure. For she does not come into view until the end of the millennium and the beginning of eternity. Now, this city was evidently in the mind of Christ when he said, I go to prepare a place for you. But the curtain does not rise upon the scene of the heavenly city until earth's drama has reached a satisfactory conclusion. Earth's sorrow is not hushed until the endless ages begin. Now, the new Jerusalem will be to eternity what the earthly Jerusalem is to the millennium. The earthly Jerusalem does not pass away, but it takes second place in eternity. Righteousness reigns in Jerusalem. It will dwell in the new Jerusalem. Imperfection and rebellion exist even in the millennial Jerusalem, Perfection and the absence of sin will identify the heavenly city. Just as a king's queen is of more importance than the place of his government, thus the new Jerusalem transcends the city of earth. This will cast no reflection on the earthly city, nor will it cause her inward pain. She can say in the spirit of John the Baptist, she that hath the bridegroom is the bride. Now, Will you notice here, the new Jerusalem is the eternal abode of the church. The new Jerusalem is the home of the church. It's the hometown of the church. This is a city toward which the church is journeying as she pitches her tent in that direction. Now we're to look at this home, and we're given the architect's blueprint here in this 21st chapter. Come hither, he says, I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, what follows is a description of the city. We have seen the psychological or the spiritual aspects of it that are wonderful, and to me more wonderful than these physical, but believe me, these are worth contemplating. Now, we must pause here to consider the relationship of the city to the citizens, the city proper to the church. Certainly, we are not to infer that the empty city without the citizens is the bride. The citizens are identified with the city in the next chapter. We are told about the citizens that are there. Those outside are identified here in chapter 21-8 as disfranchised. Although a distinction between the bride and the city needs to be maintained, it's the intent of the writer to consider them together. Now, this passage is a description of the adornments which reveals something of the love and worth that the bridegroom has conferred upon his bride. Now we read in verse 10, that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now certainly this city has no counterpart among earth's cities. They're built upon an earthly foundation, and they come up from the bottom. This city comes down out of heaven. She originates in heaven, and God is their architect, that is, the Lord Jesus. And he's the builder. Although the city comes down out of heaven, there's no suggestion that she comes down to the earth. The earthly city never goes to heaven, and the heavenly city never comes to earth. Just how far down the city descends is a matter of speculation. Now, this has led to extreme views in interpreting the New Jerusalem. At the very beginning, Ebionism, one of the first heresies, went to the extreme in applying this whole passage 
concerning the new Jerusalem to the earthly Jerusalem. Now the Gnostics, another early heresy, they went to the other extremity in spiritualizing the passage to make it refer to heaven. Now many modernisms apply the new Jerusalem to themselves and set it up on earth at the geographic location of their choice. Now liberal theologians and our millenarians have left the city in heaven in spite of the scriptural statement that it comes down out of heaven. Two facts are evident from this passage. It comes down out of heaven, and it is not stated that it comes to the earth. Now, the passage of Scripture leaves the city hanging in midair. Now, that's the dilemma that many seek to avoid. But why not leave the city in midair? Is there anything in Congress about a civilization out yonder in space on a new planet? The new Jerusalem will either become another satellite to the earth, or what's more probable, and I think is true, the earth will become a satellite to the new Jerusalem as well as the rest of the new creation. This chapter indicates that the city will be the center of all things. All activity and glory revolve about this city. God will be there. It will be his headquarters, and his universe is theocentric, that is, God-centered. The new Jerusalem is therefore worthy to merit such a preeminent position for eternity. Now let me read verse 11. Having the glory of God in her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. Now Paul instructs the believers to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 2. Now this hope will be realized in the holy city. Man in sin has never witnessed the revelation of the glory of God. Now, the experience of Israel in the wilderness taught them that each time there was rebellion in the camp, the glory of God appeared in judgment. But the manifestation of God's glory strikes terror to a sinful heart. Well, what glorious anticipation to be able to behold His glory when standing clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Two wonderful facts make this city the manifestation of the fullness of God's glory. The presence of God makes the city the source of glory for the universe. Every blessing radiates from this city. And second, the presence of the saints. Do not forbid the manifestation of the glory of God. Sin caused God to remove His glory from man's presence. In this city, all that's past. Redeem man. Dwelling with God in a city, having the glory of God is the grand goal which is worthy of God. This city reveals the high purpose of God in the church, which is to bring many sons to glory. Now, the word translated light here, foster, is the word for source of light. The city is a light giver. It does not reflect light as the moon nor does it generate light by physical combustion like the sun, but it originates light and is the source of light for the presence of God. And Christ give explanation to this as he declared, I am the light. I'm the light of the world, and God is light. The whole city is like a precious gem. This gem is likened unto a jasper stone. Now, the modern jasper is multicolored quartz stone. And the stone referred to here cannot be that, for this stone is not opaque. Jasper is a transliteration of the word iaspis, which is of Semitic origin. And Moffat suggests that iaspis could mean the modern opal, diamond, or topaz. And the stone is transparent and gleaming, which suggests one of these stones most likely is the diamond. The diamond seems to fit the description better than any other stone known to man. And the similarity of the Hebrew word for crystal in Ezekiel 1.22 to the Hebrew word for ice helps to strengthen the view. The new Jerusalem is a diamond in a gold mounting. This city is the engagement ring of the bride. In fact, it's the wedding ring. It's the symbol of the betrothal and wedding of the church to Christ. Now, the wall and the gates. Notice here, I'm reading. The wall of a city is for protection. 
and I probably ought to go back and read for you verses 12 through 16. And it had a wall, great and high, had 12 gates, and of the gates, 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, on the west, three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now we're coming to this physical description. And of course, I'm not going to have the opportunity to get into all of the details today. But the wall of the city is for protection. A walled city is a safe city. Now, the new Jerusalem is safe, and those who dwell therein dwell in safety. The heavenly Salem will enjoy the fruits of safety and peace, made up of those who found peace with God on earth, and she will experience the fullness of peace throughout eternity. The walls are a sign that this city has achieved the full meaning of her name, peace. The walls are 144 cubits in height, or about 216 feet. Herodotus gives the estimation for the walls of ancient Babylon as 50 cubits high and 200 cubits high. Now, these walls were built to make the city impregnable. The great height of the walls of the New Jerusalem are but commensurate with the great size of the city. Beauty rather than protection is the motive and design. It is a wall with jasper built into it and is generally designated a jasper wall, the hardest of substances, and the most beautiful gem constitute the exterior of this city. Now, there are 12 gates to this city, three gates on each side. On each gate is the name of one of the tribes of Israel. Now, this is very striking and suggests immediately the order of the children of Israel about the tabernacle. The tribe of Levi, as the priesthood, served in the tabernacle proper. Now, the new Jerusalem is a temple or tabernacle in one sense, for God is there with man. The church constitutes the priesthood who serve him constantly. They serve as such in the city and dwell there as Levi did about the tabernacle. Everything in eternity will face in toward this city, for God is there. The children of Israel on earth will enjoy the same relationship to the city that they did toward the wilderness tabernacle and later the city temple. This city will be a tabernacle to Israel. The children of Israel will be among the multitudes who come into this city to worship in eternity. They will come from the earth to bring their worship and glory. They'll not dwell in the city any more than they dwelt in the tabernacle of old. Those who actually dwell there will be the priests who are the church. The church occupies the closer place to God in eternity. And the bride, like John in the upper room, reclines upon his breast. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved, asks the song of Solomon? Well, she's the bride. And she's come up from the wilderness, which is this present world. But the 12 tribes of Israel will come up to the celestial city to worship, three tribes coming up on each of the four sides, and then they will return back to the earth after a period of worship. But the church will dwell in the new Jerusalem. Now, we'll go on with that next time. And until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Only those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior will dwell in the New Jerusalem. And our prayer is that as the Word of God goes out today, many will gain entrance to that heavenly city. But we can't get the Word out alone. We need your help while we still have a window of opportunity. As I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we'd love to have you join our world prayer team. We really do believe that the most important way to partner with Through the Bible is to pray with us. And that's what our world prayer team is. It's a group of faithful listeners who support this ministry in prayer one country at a time. 
So visit our website at ttb.org forward slash pray. Our look at the New Testament continues tomorrow when Dr. McGee continues our study of Revelation in chapter 21. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.